Okay, so we will now move on to the experimental workshop called Bringing Narrative and Visual Research Methods to Transplant with Dr. Suze Burkut and Dr. Marie-Chantal Fortin. The purpose of this activity is to experience one way that researchers use artistic or creative visual methods to explore people's experiences. Suze is an early career clinician investigator and practicing psychiatrist. Her pr program of research in feminist philosophy of science, science and technology studies, utilizes ethnographic and narrative qualitative methods to explore social and cultural issues impacting access and navigation through healthcare systems. Within this work, she focuses on the importance of the lived experience in relation to knowledge in and of medicine and related to mental health especially. Her transplant-related research examines the challenges that span the process of solid organ transplantation, from waitlisting and psychosocial assessment to adherence to medical advice to long-term survivorship and graft failure, and she uses arts-based approaches and ethnography to understand how social, cultural, and biological issues come together in these areas and their impact on patients, support persons, and clinical teams. Marie Chantal is a transplant nephrologist at the Centre Hospitalier de l'Université de Montréal, Le CHUM, a researcher at the Research Centre of the CHUM and a professor at the Faculty of Medicine of the Université de Montréal. Her research interests are related to transplantation ethics and patient and research partnership in research and clinical care. She is a member of the Ethics Committee of Transplant Québec, the Canadian Blood Services and the Collège des Médecins du Québec. Finally, she is also a research scholar of the FRQS. So thanks so much, uh, Suze and Maître Chantal, for joining us, and uh, we look forward to the session. I'm going to hand out these to everyone while you start talking. OK, so bonjour tout le monde, bon matin. Uh, thank you, Mamata, for this kind introduction. And thanks to the organizing committee to give us the opportunity to do this workshop. Uh, well, again, I will be the mini weeds, but I'll be the dull and brown and nutritive side. And Suze will be the sugary coat of the mini weeds. So for, for those of you who knew Sylvain, I was also uh, in our pair. I was also the dull, the the boring side of the mini wheat. So, <laughs> anyways, as you all know, transplantation comes with many challenges: emotional distress, uncertainty, fear of graft loss, guilt for the deceased donor, immunosuppressive uh, drugs, and related adverse effects, and changes in personal identity. What are art-based interventions? Well, it involves creative activities within the healthcare system, and it may improve self-esteem, cognitive functions, and decrease stress and anxiety. So it could be paintings, drawings, creative writing, dancing, well, any artistic activities. So in the next slide, I will present what Suze is doing and also what I'm doing, which are a bit different, but uh, are really connected. So uh, Suze is doing research creation and creation as research. So research creation is a term widely used in Canada in the social science and humanities to capture an approach that brings together academic and artistic tools for the generation of new interdisciplinary knowledges. Artistic practices are not therapy or treatment or intervention. They are used to explore knowledge that is linked to the senses, to emotion, to affect and embody knowledge and looks at how the expression of these through arts practices offer a different lens than look, uh, looking at the issues from a clinical or biomedical framework. Artistic practices here are both method and scholarly output. Creation as research is one way of doing this, where the artistic practices and the research practices intermingle. They are changed through the process of using arts to bring forward new ways of knowing an issue. The image you see is from a live illustration of a public salon where artists gathered to, try to screen their work, moving image, image 
artistic film, documentary film, all relating to transplantation and engaged in a roundtable discussion of how the visual form, the soundscapes and scores in the films reflected knowledge of transplantation that wasn't as commonly understood. The live illustration is a visual and artistic rendering of that roundtable discussion, which further brings forward new ways of understanding the impact of arts itself for creating new knowledge. Art Bates knowing in transplantation can take different forms, performance, installation, artist talks, film, moving image, discussion, score, immersion in sound, tactile piece that can manipul be manipulated within an exhibition. What link these different things together is that the form matters in how new knowledge is produced. Artistic works are aesthetic and body. They engage multiple senses simultaneously. They reflect nonlinear ways of understanding. These qualities offer something different than what we understand from male scores, creatinine, CPATs, or other scales and measures in me medicine. Well, what I'm doing with patients is more creative writing. What is creative writing? Well, it's a form of artistic expression. It could be comic strips, screenwriting, poetry, fiction, storytelling. It has been described as a therapeutic tool, a therapeutic tool and allow patients to express emotion and fears. And it goes beyond uh, the testimony. So this is a project that I'm conducting with a uh, um, literature scholars, Catherine Mavrikakis, who is a well-known novelist who won many prizes, and Smo Arel. So since uh, September 2020, we are conducting creative writings, workshops with transplant patients, transplant candidates, and living kidney donors. So how it works? We have two sessions, 90 minutes each, uh, two weeks uh, held apart it, that are led by professional writers. So it, it was a novelist, poet, comic artist, screenwriter, etc. And now this year, uh, patients who participated to the first creative writing are now, some of them are now conducting with professional writers uh, creative writing workshops. So during the first session, the leader explained, presented a short text. For example, the first session was on the gift. So she presented a short text on the gift and then tell the requirements for the creative writing. Patients go back home, they write what they have to write. And when they come back, they share the creative writing between them and they have to comment on the writings. So the, well, patients and writers work together on the text and the patients who agreed, well, their writing are now posted on our website, lorganon.ca, it's all in French, but you can uh, go and see. There are even uh, some uh, sound uh, recording where people just made some creative with uh, what they remind of the ICU and so on. And finally, the last slide is that we, with the first uh, group of patients, well, we've done some interviews pre-workshop uh, where they told us about their uh, significant moments, the loneliness that they live with transplant and the uncertainty. And we also conduct interviews with participants to the workshop and they really, uh, well, Creative writing were described as therapeutic and also an opportunity to give back to others. They really appreciate the small community. They were talking about their creative writing, but that was uh, you know, a pretext to, to discuss about other things and share experience. So right now, that's it. It's all the theory about uh, what we're going to do. Um, what we wanted to do was just give you a sense of the some of the kinds of things that you might someone might do when they're doing um, arts based research. And the the sort of arts based research sort of landscape is enormous. 
Um, but we, what we wanted to do was try to, to let you kind of try out what, what it is and, and what's going on. Um, for those who are in the room, you got to, uh, there's a, the tables should all have at least one of these pieces of paper, and then there should be some blank paper around. I've got more up at the front. Um, but if you look to the side that says visual research methods experience, I thought I, we would just sort of give you one of the things that we often use as a warm up. So this is sort of um, uh, sometimes the, the kind of thing that we might do to um, help people move into a nonverbal expressive space. And so the idea of the warm up is to try to um, come into a space where you're not sort of having to articulate all of your experiences in a way that has sort of narrative coherence. And so the idea of, a, of this, what we do is, is a scribble. So, uh, and, like you, and literally it is a scribble. So using a piece of paper, it can be um, this page if you want, or the blank paper that was sort of circulating around, there's more up here. Um, all you you have to do is kind of grab some sort of material and um, and writing material. There's also some pens and markers and stuff, and just sort of let your hand go. Let your hand go. Let your hand move freely. You can modify the paper that you have by crumpling it. You can use different kinds of things together or separately. Tearing paper, that kind of thing. Just sort of move into that nonverbal space by letting yourself try out some materials in a free form way. And it's a little bit awkward to do in a big conference hall like this. Often when we're doing these kinds of things we're in sort of a small kind of group together and all the stuff sort of in the middle but we'll, we'll kind of give it our best shot um, and what we'll, when we're done um, I'll just sort of show you what we would do in the kind of group setting once we've got the scribble so you can sort of see how the sort of discussion about the scribble gets sort of facilitated so use your paper or use something that you've got I've got some notepads up here as well um, there's the markers and just sort of give yourself a couple minutes to to do a scribble and scribble on your page problem. I'll, I'll show mine and I'll sort of give a, a, a model of kind of how we might talk about it in the sort of workshops that I run. Um, so we, as I said, we use this sort of scribble as a way to shift out of the kind of narrative conventions, the coherence, the requirement that you articulate things in a clear way and sort of move into using our bodies and our hands and our experiences and our senses in a different sort of way. So this was the, the scribble that I made with the pencil that I had. Um, and so what we might do, you know, oftentimes we'll use the scribbles to introduce ourselves. So I've written my name at the bottom and my pronouns over here. Um, and then, you know, I might, I, we might invite people to reflect on why they scribbled the way they did or what they think kind of came out. Like when I look at this, there is a swirling mass of overlapping kind of rounded linear marks it's a lot of chaos in there. And then I sort of felt like tearing, crumpling and tearing the edges of the paper. And as I was doing this, I was looking at the clock counting down and that sort of, I think that's just sort of part of the, the sort of space that I'm in right now. Um, I don't know if anyone else in the room wants to sort of hold up their scribble or sort of show what they were, but that this was sort of like swirling chaos, some, some blank space over here, but then I started tearing that blank space. And I think that to me is is a sort of like the the clock counting down while I'm sitting at the front of the stage is sort of reflective of of that but um I would welcome anyone to if there's anyone else who wants to sort of hold up their scribble to sort of show what they've what they've done then I'd be happy to sort of but that that's the kind of thing that we might do um is kind of comment on the, the person themselves holding it up might comment on what they were feeling as they were making it. Someone else might comment on uh, what they notice about it. And that's sort of one of the things about the um, a lot of the arts-based practices is that part of what is important about them isn't that you are telling a, a specific story or that there's a specific representation that's going on, but it's about a kind of witnessing process and looking at things like the form um, and the shape and the structure. You might also look at different kinds of textures. So if you were pressing really hard with a marker or a crayon in some places and lighter in others, and thinking about how those different kinds of movements that you're doing with your body also translate into things that are that are meaningful. And so that's the kind of thing that we would do in the sessions is also kind of really reflect on the form, what we see, the texture, the shape, and then relate that to our own kind of emotional experience. So it, it's a very non-representational way of getting into a kind of space of experience. It doesn't expect people to have a kind of coherent uh, or a coherence to what it is that that they're experiencing. And in the in the research practice that I do, I think one of the things that that really sort of helps to reveal 
are the sorts of ways that people's, like everybody's experiences can be layered. They can be kind of internally contradictory. There can be um, simultaneous sorts of things. Like, and if we think about something like transplantation, um, simultaneously, someone might feel gratitude. They might feel obligation. They might feel despair. They might not have a space for that despair because that's not the sort of socially acceptable sort of like feelings that they have about the experience that they had, the sort of socially acceptable kinds of, or the sort of cultural script for transplantation might have to do a lot more with things like a gift or a gratitude. Um, and so the kinds of other sorts of layers of experience may be harder to, um, to be able to, and not have a, a space or not have a kind of cultural script for us to be able to share. And so entering into these kinds of non-representational, non, also non-causal kinds of things. There's, these are like sort of non-linear sorts of associations that people make. It, it opens up a, a way to be able to express those things that don't have um, easy ways of being expressed. And so we often kind of start that with something like this, with the scribble. Um, we're gonna try on the other side of your page, there is a narrative research methods experience description. And so we thought we would give this a try in this second part of the, um, the workshop. And that's a sort of immersive experience to give you an example of how people might use a narrative method in their, in their study. Um, uh, this is also an approach that sometimes gets used in forms of therapy in mental health called narrative therapy. And so we've sort of, uh, sometimes there's a, there can be a, a line that gets blurred between things that are therapeutic and things that are sort of research. But um, what we're going to do is have everyone kind of give this a try. So what you're going to do is you can use, if you've got this page, you can, you can use this blank space. Uh, you can use a computer if you want. There's other paper around. Um, but the idea here is that we're going to write a very short story. And you're only going to have five to seven minutes, and you're not allowed to really think about it. And that's actually the point of this exercise, is that you don't think about what it is that you're writing about. There's no right or wrong way to write the story. It could be simply words on a page. They could be words that look like a crossword puzzle. They could, it could be uh, poetry. It doesn't, it could be just a story. Um, it could have a beginning, middle, or an end. It doesn't have to. Um, but what the, uh, and as I said, the short time frame is very purposeful. It's just to get you in the space of writing what comes to mind without thinking too much about what you're going to say or how you're going to say it. Um, so we'll take five to seven minutes now. And the prompt that you have, which I'd invite you to use, is to write a story about a gift. That's the only instruction that you've got. You've got about five minutes now. Try not to think about it and let your, let your pen, let your marker, let your um, pencil go and write a story about a gift. All right. And as we, cut, as we come back together, you can finish up your last sort of sentence or so. I wonder if anyone uh, feels like they might be able to offer a bit of a reflection on, uh, you don't have to share your story in, right now unless you'd, unless you'd like to, but what, what was it like to actually sort of be given a prompt that you didn't really know anything about and have sort of five or seven minutes to sit and, and write something? Um, uh, would anyone in the room or online be willing to sort of step to a mic or unmute themselves and sort of talk a little bit about what that was like. Oh. Thanks. Yeah, we've got a couple of people coming up here. Um, so I'm Joanna Mitchell. I'm a mom to a heart transplant recipient. So, I mean, a gift for me is obviously quite easily to um, talk about because my daughter was given the gift of life with a, a new heart. Um, I just sort of went through all the gifts that came from one, that one gift, you know, it was a gift to me because it gave me the chance to become a mother. It was a gift to people that hear her story and are inspired by her story. Um, the gift of being able to see life through her eyes and um, watching her resilience, resiliency as she grows up and getting to watch her grow up um, and she's actually an artist. So being able to see the gift of her sharing her art with the world. So it was just one gift leading into so many other gifts for me. 
was there anything that surprised you uh, that came out in the story that you were writing as you were writing it? Um, no, I don't think so, because this is something that I've had to think about many times over the years. Um, so this one came more easily to me than maybe the, the first activity of, of drawing. Mm -hmm. And I'm more of a words person. So this was uh, an easier one for me. Did you find that that connection, the sort of cascading of gifts was something that you've, um, is that also something that you've thought about before? Or is that sort of like the, the connections between these different kinds of, of things that have kind of transpired from, from that, that first gift? Um, I, I, I have thought about it um, over the years, um, but putting it all down together and sort of seeing that connection from one gift to the next gift and how it leads together is definitely an interesting pattern. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that from the sort of unstructured writing can kind of transpire, unfold, like where you're not planning and sitting and planning a story so much, but where you're, you know, where you're, you're just kind of letting things come out onto the page, then you, you can kind of end up having these connections that aren't ones that you've sort of thought about kind of ahead of time. Yeah, like my writing was a lot more just sort of one flowing into another rather mm -hmm. than like structured sentences. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I tend to be more of a structured writer normally. Yeah. So I just kind of let it flow one into another. Great. Thank you. And I see uh, Sandra on this on the screen. Hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, yeah, sure, I, I'd share. Um, so I started with just thinking that like gifts can come in many forms. So if we think of a gift like something we receive in a package could be uh, for our birthday, a wedding, or an anniversary. Um, but also, you know, and it could be something that you wanted or that you didn't. Um, uh, gifts can also be talents or skills that you have. Um, a special, a special ability, and intuition, uh, having uh, empathy and caring, um, even skills like carpentry, uh, science <laughs> background, um, and so much more. And so, my ideas of a good gift is a, a great friend, time with loved ones, and family, um, and also um, the gift of health. Right is is also important. And uh, as Joanne mentioned receiving my liver transplant 25 years ago, um, I would say is probably the best gift I've ever received. Um, I also think it's, um, it, I feel gifted to have had a great uh, mom and dad and parents, uh, a loving and caring husband that I'm actually taking care of right now. <laughs> and um, yeah, and the gift of love. And I also said I wouldn't be also, if I didn't have the opportunity to have my transplant and to be, um, you know, shared gift with those that like passed on history and taught me lessons that I wouldn't be here today to share my gifts. So, and one of the things I wanted to say, Susie, about this is that how much it just made me so relaxed. And um, so I can understand why people enjoy writing. Thank you so much. And I, I think one of the things that we would do in a in a writing group a lot of times um, would be, so if Sandra was uh, sh sharing um, their story that they've written, um, then what what we sometimes would do, like one, one process, and uh, Marie Chantel, I don't know if this is sort of where your group also would go, is that in a, in a writing workshop sort of setting, you might then invite the, uh, the writer to share their piece. And then the writer sort of steps back. So Sandra had just shared their piece, then they might step back. And then the rest of the group would kind of come together to reflect on what they heard, what stood out to them, how it made them feel. And that's sort of the, the key kinds of components again that are, and then the, and then the writer would be in, invited back in to also reflect on what it was like to hear the group around them um, giving feedback and responses to their story. And that kind of witnessing practice is, um, is really an important component of drawing out what is um, in, meaningful and important and drawing out the, the kinds of ways that 
um, creative practices especially can, um, can bring forward different kinds of feelings and affects compared to other types of uh, research practices. And so to give an example, Sandra, as you were speaking, um, the thing that came to my mind in the in the story that you were telling about your your thinking about about the your gift was um, was the way in which there are these kinds of reverberations. So a gift that you received 25 years ago has then also translated into all of these other kinds of um, interactions. Uh, and and I was thinking about the sort of networks of of caring that are happening because of that one gift, however long ago. Um, now you you have your own kinds of gifts that you are offering other people, and and there's a sort of similarity to the story that that Joanne was also um, saying about about her daughter's gift, and and then being able to share the sort of um, her own talents and art with with the world. And there's these sorts of reverberations that are that are happening, um, and that they and there's a kind of a looping of all of the these sorts of things and those loops are kind of within networks of care and networks of of kin and they are sort of expanding what those networks look like um and so that's a that's sort of the thing that stands out to me uh when i when i hear those two stories um and i but i'd be you know welcome other people's kind of reflections um and and that would be the the kind of process that you might take within within the writing group okay, please I guess I'll show my sketch sure, thank first, you. if yeah, that's yeah. okay. So it's kind of exactly what you said in terms of it being like a roller coaster in my eyes, that it's very up and down. And I'm a, I'm a kidney patient. And uh, yeah, our, our journey is never straightforward. It's always up and down. Um, and there's also, also interlays um, in terms of our emotions and how we're feeling and what we go through. And I also kind of, crump, not crumples, I fold in my paper in different ways because there's many layers as kidney patients um, in terms of who we affect, who affects us, um, and how we live our day, our life day to day. So that's kind of my art art piece of it. And I, I'm like Joanna's daughter, I do a lot of art stuff too. So this I found very interesting. Um, and I probably would have added more because I like adding more until I realized I should have stopped. Um, so I would have done it a lot more details. Um, and roughly in terms of my story, my gift is more so about sharing my story um, and being humble about it and sharing it to pay, to other patients, recipients, living donors, caregivers who are first learning or are still on that path, but need that extra support. Would you like to read it for the group? I, I don't know. Okay, no worries, no worries. <laughs> I'm already kind of emotional. I'm kind of like, ooh. Um, but like in my line of work, I, I am a social worker and I do support patients living through their journey. So I find it humbling that I, I've been doing this for 27 years, that even getting the gift of life, sometimes that gift isn't meant to be. And so I've had two transplants that didn't work out. So it was a gift from a deceased donor, but it wasn't, yeah, wasn't meant to be. Um, but being able to share that knowledge with others, I find it very rewarding and it helps me grow. Uh, roughly from what I see here um, with that knowledge and uh, giving back. So that's a huge, huge gift, giving back and like being a part of the CDRP. Um, I think that's a huge, huge gift as well. And other organizations that you can, as a patient partner, give that information and that knowledge and that support and knowing the whole concept that you're not alone. I think that's really huge. Was there anything um, in writing your story, since it's one that, you know, you, you have said that like you're, you, you share and it's a, it's a, it's an honor for you to be able to get to share it. Was there anything in writing it out in this, this iteration that stood out to you that sort of jumped out as a, you know, a, either a different kind of quality of the experience or something that was surprising or something that struck you? I think it's also being a part of this event with the experts that makes it interesting because we can hear it from their perspectives on what they're trying to do and accomplish for the greater good of the populations. That is very interesting, I find. Mm -hmm. And that kind of correlates to what I'm doing because I can take that back to support that there are renal professionals and liver professionals and heart professionals, organ professionals that are there to support our population in their ebbs and flows and know that they have our back and that the research is being done to find you know, not just a cure, but better ways of living your life and accommodating 
what you're going through into your, into your everyday living. And that's really important because mm-hmm. we want to be able to still, I don't know why I'm getting choked up. I'm not even going to cry. Sorry. Mm-hmm. It's just my voice. Um, but that we're still able to live our lives and do all the things we want to do with our families and travel and do everything. Like even being here, it was, we were able to do it with that support. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a really important piece that when I was writing that, I did, I did reflect on that. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. And I, I think it, it speaks, what you're saying also speaks to the way in which the context that you're in is going to shape the kind of story that you can tell. And so in, in things like, um, you know, people who do work in things like narrative theories and narrative kinds of studies, um, they might talk about that and about how um, stories have what some people would call like a, a truth in the telling. And so your story at any one point in time might be a, a certain kind of partial perspective. It's not a finalized story. There's not, even if you've written a story with a beginning, middle and end, that end is one sort of end in this moment and it's shaped by the context that's around you. And so then I think when we think about things like this in terms of research practices, it also makes us think about what does that then, how does that structure that is around people, how does the context that's around people shape what kinds of stories they can tell. So um, other people um, in sort of the like area of philosophy talk about um, things like uh, what's called the like rhetorical space. And so there, there are some places with that create a rhetorical space or a space for certain sorts of stories to be told. And that it's important if you're doing, um, especially in things like narrative research, that you understand how the, the structure and the context will shape what story can be told. And so then how do you make um, from a research sort of standpoint, different kinds of settings that can allow different sorts of stories to to come forward. And, and again, sort of seeing those as not being sort of finalized, but that they're these iterative kinds of things and there are truths in certain tellings. And so I think that's sort of, um, a, you know, often a, a fundamental kind of Com- component of thinking about doing things like arts-based research or especially in, in other kinds of qualitative research where we're not necessarily having a, a finalized answer to something, but it's an answer and it's um, an answer in a moment that's in a particular point in time. Um, and that might shift and change depending on sort of what's what's around it and what's what enables it. And so you could imagine that a, a, an arts-based research practice that's in a hospital setting might produce different kinds of stories than than one that's in um, a home setting or that's in a community center or and so then and also who feels enabled to be able to come into that space and share a story is going to be shaped by the kinds of histories that people have um, in terms of what that space means to them and so it's sort of part of what goes into thinking about things like research design within using these kinds of uh, methodologies um, is that 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 space and that context is going to shape what story comes forward and who can say it. Um, I see the clock ticking down again, and I'm reminded of my my own drawing. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything in the last few minutes, Marie Chantel, that you'd like to add, or if we, I don't know if we've used up our whole time to uh, to also have more reflections, but I did, I'd welcome that. Just a question. Um, you're talking about adult research. So this just sounds honestly so perfect for, especially for the young adults, for the teenagers, the preteens. Um, this is you know, has there been any work done in that? Or is that an area that you're exploring to move this type of research into into that age category? Thanks. It's a it's a great question. And I, I think there is a lot of resident, there are a lot of resonances as well with people who do work in arts, health, and what's called play. So there is sort of like a, and and some of that ties into things like play therapies, but as sort of uh in you know, and there has to be a lot of thoughtfulness about how you transition things that started out as a therapy into a research method because they're they're you know you're you're doing very different things and with different kinds of aims um but there are definitely people i actually am just kind of connecting in with and expanding kind of a network of health humanities folks in canada and the uk and and there's a there are like a there's a group of definitely a group of people who have a, a strong interest in health arts and and play specifically with um with kids and there there is sort of in depending on where you go and where you look there's there are different kinds of things that people have done in in younger groups and and um uh, some of the sort of popular kinds of things that um there's uh, i've got a colleague at york university who does digital storytelling work with uh with young people and they've actually started using a bunch of things like uh green screen sort of 
uh, clothing. Uh, and so then they can, they can also animate things that are happening in relation to their bodies on the green screen. And so then they create sort of a, a film or a short film. Um, they've also done some work with puppets. Um, and, uh, and I, I think um, my experience has been that letting, uh, particularly when you've got young, younger sort of um, like adolescents and teens, like letting people really have a lot of control over the the modality that they're working in is is really important and then giving people the sort of space and the the skills and and sort of where the the technical sort of side of things is not too overwhelming but but where they can sort of facilitate a, a vision coming forward is also really important so there's i think there's a few things that are kind of important for the the practice and one is having choice and and um agency over what kinds of form you end up engaging with and then having that space for the, the reflection to kind of to to come through and then not and having things set up so that it's not too intimidating that the technical side of things is facilitated and isn't intimidating but then people really have a lot of a, a, you know sense of capacity in having created something and, and sort of had a vision or a story that was hard to say kind of come to life in in a way that that they that that that's a really meaningful and important part of the the, the practice as well in research. Um, but yeah. If you uh, just to mention also, there's a, during, in the US, there's an experience uh, during summer camp for kidney transplant adolescents. There was a poet who was there and was doing creative writing activities where adolescents had to write some poetry and there were, for many years, the adolescents were coming back to, and there's a book published and there, there are some initiative and you're right, Ellen, we should probably work with adolescents, but I'm working with adults, so it's why I'm biased, but uh, I think, yeah, it's probably well designed for adolescents, young, young adults. The participants we had in our creative writing workshop well, it was not the young adults, it was mostly all uh, people, probably because they had time, they were not overwhelmed, you know, during the pandemics with family, kids, and so on. So it was mostly people in their 60s, they had high literacy. Uh, that's one problem because we want, it could be also appropriate for people who have low level of literacy it just depends how you design your activities so but uh yeah totally we should uh, probably work but i need pediatric colleagues and to to uh, work on this so um thank you everyone for your uh very generous participation and and bringing yourselves forward uh to all of us so thank you so much for um taking part